Welcome everybody. Glad to have you all back. Um, we're going to go into chapter 5 of James today, final chapter of this study in this book. Uh, it's been great. I think if you were to write down all the things that you've learned from the book of James and you were really paying attention, you'd have quite a notebook. Um, Actually, if you just had the outlines that I've been passing around through the whole thing all filled in and maybe your little squiggly notes on there too and everything, you'd have quite a notebook on this. So anyway, today you hopefully you got one. They were in the bulletin. A little outline with the points that, that we're going to be looking at. Uh, one thing I'll have you notice in, the, in chapter 5, these next six verses that we're going to be looking at, James will address those who may or may not be real believers in Christ. Um, but their social attitudes are not in keeping with the Spirit of Christ. So remember that as we're looking at this. He's not saying they're not believers. He's not saying they are. They might be. But what we are saying is that their, um, their social attitudes are not in keeping with the Spirit of Christ. So anyway, let's look at the first three verses now, one through three. Uh, now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth is rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Now, it's true that this book of James is written to the believers in Christ who happen to have Hebrew Jewish background. Um, they, they were the completed Jews, so to speak, Messianic Jews tra that had had traveled throughout the nations. We know that at the time, um, in this first century AD, there were many people still up in Babylon, in that area, that were Jewish, that had not ever returned during Nehemiah's day. They just stayed up in that area, but they had synagogues and they continued to uh, be Jewish believers in God, in the law of Moses and all that, and they were up in that area to the north, which would now be modern-day Iraq, the area where they, they were up at, at that time. Lots of Jewish people still up there in the first century AD. We know that Peter, traditionally through extra-biblical uh, accounts and histor historical books, uh, says that Peter traveled up into that area and pretty much became the apostle to uh, the Hebrew people who had not settled back in the land and went up to tell them, hey, guess what, Messiah has come. Messiah has come. You've been waiting for him. He's come. And so there were many believers in Christ with Jewish background that were up in the north. So some have said that that was maybe possibly where the letter traveled to first. Um, who knows? Not really sure. We know that James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem at the, right before the dispersal in 70 AD where everybody ran away. Um, they were chased off and they were burned out and all of that. But right up before that point, James had been the leader in the church of Jerusalem. So writing to Jewish believers in Christ would have been his first stop right there in his home territory. So anyway, knowing that about that, um, we know that he's addressing those who are outside of the community of believers, sort of, when he says, you rich people. It's like the, even the flavor or the uh, feel in the grammar of his wording here is, it seems as though he's talking to people who are not currently in fellowship. Now, that doesn't mean that they aren't believers. There are many believers today that we know they are believers in Christ, but they're not always in fellowship, right? They're not around that often. We might be missing them for months. And then we see them, and oh, great, you know, they're still part of the fellowship. They are believers, right? So it kind of seems as though he's talking to that outskirts, not to the ones that he would see uh, every few days, you know, and all that, but the ones that are out there sending the letter out, read these things. And, um, and he's saying, you rich people, because some of them were wealthy, very wealthy among this. But what, what he's doing is he's going after an attitude that's not the Spirit of Christ. It's not the Christ-like attitude of being others-centric. 
rather, rather than self-centric, right? It's not the one that would be making sure that your brothers are taken care of. It's the hoarders <laughs> that are keeping everything to themselves. You know, so anyway, these rich people are those worldly unbelieving who use wealth in selfish worldly ways. This is going back to uh, joining the previous dialogue in chapter 2, verses 6 through 7, actually, regarding those who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong. If you claim you belong to Christ, you're wearing his badge, but you're not representing him, you're taking the Lord's name in vain, right? That's exactly what's happening. And uh, th that is what this book is about, proper representation of Christ. If you're going to wear his badge, wear his name, and claim to be him, you better be representing him, showing the true face of Christ out there, not your worldly, selfish ways that you've become accustomed to. So there is, there is, there's sin that's in the life of these believers. Do you think that's not possible? <laughs> A, a believer could be uh, one who trusts in Christ and saved, right? But they've got sin in their life. Absolutely, right? All you have to do is look in the mirror and you know it's true, right? And no, don't, don't even be trying to deny it. We'll go down through the, the Ten Commandments and show you real quick, you know. But we're not perfect. Look at, look at uh, Romans chapter 7. Paul talked about his suffering that he was going through with the flesh all the time. Uh, the battle going on between the new nature and the flesh. But always, whenever, make sure when you read Romans chapter 7 to read that, be sure and read at least the first few verses in chapter 8 before you put your Bible away. Because you've got to make sure that's still there too. All right. But anyway, these people were not doing right. Uh, they, they were, uh, so maybe they're believers, okay, but you can't tell by what they're doing. Because their actions are not acting like one, right? But we're not the judge of whether or not they're truly a believer or not. If they claim they're a believer, we leave it at that. Someone claims they're a Christian, they're a believer, we leave it at that. But if I'm choosing someone to fill a role, a leadership role or something in the church, I'm going to see some fruit. I'm going to see that they, they actually do seem like one, you know, and, and not appoint someone who doesn't have any fruit to a, a, any kind of role of leadership. Anyway, uh, here, he's addressing these people who allow their wealth to become their God. They trust in it and are willing to step on others to get it. Um, the warning is that a time is coming when they'll lose their wealth. We know that that happened right there in Jerusalem. Time was coming where the Roman army came right in and took it from all of them. So it was coming where they would lose their wealth to unexpected circumstances that robbed it. Uh, they have hoarded wealth, which is not the same as storing up provision, but doing so in such a way that deprives others of having enough. Um, having some preparation for the time of storm is wisdom. That's fine. If you want to have a pantry with lots of stocked up goods, you want to have some extra things for when the power gets cut off, that's just wisdom. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But when, when you're getting all you can and, and buying it up and keeping it so that others can't have it, because you're going to watch and see them suffer, and then you'll be the one that has, and they're the have-nots when it comes down to it, and that's just evil. Anyway, um, these hoarders have allowed their wealth to become their god. And that's what he's noticing here in this. And, and when it's taken away, what are you going to have left? You know, you didn't even buy friends for yourself by making sure and taking care of others. Even if that's done from improper motive, at least you'd buy friends, right? You know, I'm not saying that going out and, and treating people and, and giving them um, gifts and things like that in order to buy friendship is necessarily a godly thing, but at least it would have made more sense than hoarding it up and making enemies out of them when the time comes to it, right? Jesus talked about being crafty and using the ways of the world in a crafty manner, that, you know, that the servants of Satan do a better job with this than the servants of the Lord do, he said. Anyway, they've, they've allowed their wealth, though, to become their God, and they've exposed their idolatry by the fact that they grieve so deeply over its loss. 
They're weeping and wailing over the corrosion of their stash shows the idolatry in comparison to one who would say like Job, it's just material stuff, right? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Job was able to say that because his faith wasn't in his stash. It, he had a lot. Job had a lot. But his faith wasn't in it. It was in God, you see. And that's the difference. Having wealth, having lots of money, is not sin. If the Lord so blesses you with it and you honor Him rightly, hey, great, he, he blessed many people in the Bible with lots of wealth and success like that. And, and He blessed them that way because He chose to. Okay, but we can't say that those who are blessed are right with God and those who aren't don't seem to be blessed financially or the ones that have a problem. We can't say that either because Jesus said, you're going to have trouble in this life. You know, so he, he promised you troubles and trials. So anyway, the last days in verse 3 is simply referencing the time of the church where uh, the church era that we live in, okay, in the last days. When he says that, it's a reference to this whole time period. And the last days has been going on for a couple thousand years now. So uh, in this phrase of the last days. Now we always say, but now we're really in the last days, right? Then you've always got people that think it's coming this weekend. Right? And, and you know what? It could happen. It could be. But I can't live as though that's going to happen. Although I kind of live as... You know what I'm saying? There's a line. There's a line. I live as though it could happen this weekend. Okay? But I still have to take care of business. And, and you know, even if I get raptured of, out, I'd like to go out of this world knowing that my bill was paid. You know? I don't know about you... But I don't want him to say, oh, he stiffed us on that. He got sucked up in the clouds and got raptured out of here and he didn't pay off his bills. I'd kind of like to know that they were taken care of even when I'm raptured. So I had a good name in going away, right? You know, but, but that's, that's just me. I know you may not care, but I don't want to be your creditor either. Anyway, all right. The last, like I said, the last days is referencing this whole age, though. When James says it here, he's talking about this time when we're supposed to be showing the face of Christ into the world. That's our job. That's why we're here, to show the true face of Christ during this era so that people can say, yeah, there is something better. There really is something better, and we might be attractive for him. So our witness during this church era is to model his ways, not the ways of the world. All right? That's the point made by this. That's our, our, our witness during this church era. Model his ways, not the ways of the world. All right, the next one, uh, verse 4. Look. The wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. So, not only do the things lost to corrosion and moths testify to the idolatry of the hoarder, but now James says that the things kept from those that have been cheated and robbed cry out against the perpetrators as well. Don't you know that to be true? You know, if, you, if someone has cheated and robbed you, what are you doing? You're telling everybody that they did, right? Most likely. You know, you're going to... Bad reviews travel fast. Right? Good ones are hard to come by. All you have to do is talk to a restaurant owner in this new thing called Yelp. You know, one bad one, and it just, it just really causes all kinds of trouble. You could have ten good ones in there, and that's fine, but one bad one could could undo them all, right? Well, that's the way it is with people, too. And if you're going to cheat people, and you're going to be known for that, you're going to cheat and rob people out of things and not treat them well, everyone's going to know it before long, that that's what you're known for. So the things that you've done cry out against you. See, that's, that's what James is saying here. So um, wealth itself is not condemned in Scripture, as I said a few minutes ago. It, but how it's acquired... And what is done with it, those are issues. So money and possessions themselves are neutral. They're tools, right? They're neutral. But what you do with them and how you acquire them, that could be at issue. 
All right. So if you steal from people to get what you have, <laughs> the possessions themselves are a witness against you when the robbed cry out to God for justice. So not, here, here's the other part, not paying a worker his wage. Now there are a few people in here who, who have employees, you know, and, and what if you were to not pay them? Do you know how long it would take for the reputation to get around that you don't pay the payroll? That's not a good place to work because you don't always know if your check's going to be good. State kind of had a problem with that for a while, didn't it? There was some issues with that. The county, even at one time, I can remember that being the case. We're not really sure we're going to get paid this payday, you know? You remember when that happened? You know, well, small business, same thing can happen. If you're not making payroll, the whole community is going to know about it. Everybody's going to know about it. What are they going to say? So, not paying the worker the wage he has earned is the same as stealing it from him. I know somebody who hired somebody to help him out and do a bunch of work for him and um, had a little bit of issue with, uh, with getting all of the cash, didn't quite get it all because that was on him because he didn't do quite all everything that he was supposed to do in uh, this little construction project. And so the, the owner was like, well, I'm not going to pay you all. I'll pay you for what you've done. But, uh, you know, anyway, so this other guy, though, that he hired to help him out with, he just didn't give it to him. He took off for the weekend and blew it all. Had a big partying weekend. He comes back and his guy who was his helper is like, hey, you were going to pay me like 200 bucks for this work that I did for you on this project. Where's my money? And he goes, oh, I don't have it. Couldn't get all the money from him. And that was, a, you know, that was kind of it. And this guy is just out, right? It, it, it led to some very hard feelings. And actually, in their case, it led to some wrestling around and falling down the stairs and bruises and bumps and bloody noses and all kinds of stuff like that, too. And um, unfortunately, the one who deserved it all wasn't the one who got hurt as much. But that's kind of the way sometimes it goes, too. Not paying the worker his wage is stealing from him. But before we think we're off the hook in this matter because we don't hire workers, so the rest of you in here that don't have employees, don't think you're off the hook here. Do you use utilities or services that you have to pay for? Do you always pay that bill? You owe it. If you don't pay those bills, not paying those bills is the same as not paying the worker his wage. Exact same thing. If you use utilities and things like that, you owe the money. Pay it. Don't let the Christians in this world be the ones that are known for not paying the bills. I'm going to tell you another story. Years back, we had another church that I had planted, right? And we moved to another location. And we started in, we came in with a deposit and all this kind of stuff to rent this location to meet for the church. And we get there and we discover that the management is like, yeah, well, mm -hmm. we'll help you out here, but you know, we rented to a church here last before, and the guy left owing two or three months worth of rent and didn't pay his PG&E bill and blah, 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 blah. We find out all this stuff, and there's, here in the mail slot, here's these past due shutoff notices and all these things, and so that was where part of it came up. We can't turn the power on to the building yet. You can rent it, but you can't have the power turned on yet until you take care of that with PG&E. And so I had to go and say, okay, do you want a deposit from us? Because we're different. Well, you're a church, all you churches are the same, right? No, we pay our bills. Well, this other place had a kind of a habit of, of the pastor uh, taking all the money that came in, and he would pay the bills if he, there was enough. And apparently there wasn't enough that came in, so he didn't pay the bills. And our, our practice was the other way around. We paid the bills first, and the pastor didn't get paid. And that's usually what happened. That happened many, many, many times. But, um, you know, that's, that's just the way it ought to be. If you're going to have a good Christian testimony, that's the way it ought to be. It's did. You know, and by the time, you know, when, when years had gone by, those people loved us around there. They were like, oh, we don't want to mess with you. You pay your bills on, on time and you do extra stuff and whatever. You, you're great with us. You're fine. You want some extra space? We'll just throw it in. Gave us extra space. No extra charge. You know, well, we were going to raise the rent a little bit. Maybe how about we just include that then? Hey, see, see what a difference that kind of thing makes. 
But no, we shouldn't be the, the kind that, that are uh, known for robbing people or not paying the bills and all that. So when we don't pay our bills, we rob those we owe. If they cry out to God over it, we would have no plea but guilty. All you can say is guilty is charged because God knows. You know good and well God knows. Don't try to hornswoggle God. Right? Don't try to say, oh yeah, but you know, it's because of this or it's because of, you know, and start justifying. He, you know good and well he knows. He knows the difference. And all you can say to him is guilty. All right, let's look at verse 5. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. Wow. So the image that comes to mind is kind of a boss hog looking guy, right? You know what I think? One person is a person, a rich person, laying around being pampered, eating expensive foods, and wasting much of it, surrounded by fancy that is nothing but show to show all the while just the outsiders watching him how much he has that's all he's doing and those who have nothing are doing without on the outside and looking and seeing this one um, waste it right you could just imagine that right right we've seen movies where the king is living like that and the poor paupers are outside and they can't even feed themselves can't feed their families they're hoping for some scraps that fall from the table right anyway um, that's the image we get out of this thing and it, this to the Lord is like an animal who voluntarily fattens itself up for slaughter <laughs> So before we're envious of such people, we should have that image in our mind. So you see the people, the boss hog kind of character that's sitting up there living high on the hog, fattening himself up. Think of that image. He's fattening himself up for the slaughter. So you won't be envious of him. Because we, we who are, are the ones doing without shouldn't be looking at those who seem to have it all made like that and being envious. No, we want to get that image in your mind so you won't want to be like them. Um, verse 6. You've condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. In the process of gaining more wealth, the rich often use their influence and financial advantage to manipulate the courts and the judges. You know that's true, right? The rich, the filthy rich, can manipulate the courts and the judges and get their way and get things passed through and step on everyone in their path on the way. Now, this is the typical story that lots of movies are made about, right? David and Goliath kind of thing, you know? Um, anyway, uh, in this verse, James is likely including that element which could result in death of the loser um, when it talks about... You know, in some cases, there, there could be back in those days under the law, there were some cases where you could be put to death for doing it. And if, you, if, you, if the rich owned the lawyers and the court and, and were buying them off, they could actually win the case to, and the result could be that the loser was actually put to death for it. So this is where we get this thing that you've murdered, right? Uh, because that is just wrong uh, to be, especially when it comes down to that. I mean, if it's just you, you don't win the case and you don't win a settlement or whatever, well, that's one thing. But when the loser could actually be put to death for it, then, and that was the, the winner using his power and influence and money in order to make that happen, that's murder. It's using the, the court system was the weapon, right? And the wealthy was murdering someone. And that's the image there that James wants us to have as well um, in this. Many of us fail to see just how wealthy we are in America, by the way, until we see real poverty face to face. And sometimes that changes the way we see things. Um, so this is another thing. According to this writing in James, we must not get caught up in the accumulation of wealth for self, but should instead share our possessions for the benefit of others to God's glory. 
All right, so that was the first six verses that I told you were to be talking about or someone who's maybe a Christian but may not be. See, because there could be Christians who their faith is in Christ, but they're still acting like this. The wealthy that, you know, that do all of that. So, like I said, it may or may not be believers, true believers, but they certainly are not acting as though they are. And the worst thing would be someone who is living that way, like the boss hog kind of character, and pushing their weight around and getting people put to death for it and all that, and wearing the Christian badge. That would be the worst thing yet. Because that would be making it look like Christ would do that. And he wouldn't do that. You see? See how important our, our representation of him in this world is? All right. So now he starts off with verses 7 and 8, um, talking to the brothers and sisters in general again here now. Uh, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Now, we changed the subject here a little bit. All right. Not the overall theme of the book, but we've kind of changed subjects here. Um, From our attitude towards wealth and others to how we are to be patient while we're enduring uh, these kinds of things. As we endure the wickedness that surrounds us and um, we watch the ungodly feast selfishly as if fattening themselves up for slaughter, we wait for our Lord's return with justice and our redemption when He comes. So be patient, by the way, um, that be patient is from the Greek compound. There's a compound word, and you get your Greek lesson here again today. And I'm going to try to pronounce this right because it's a bad one. I mean, it's macrothymosate. Yeah, you can remember that one, right? Macrothymosate. All right, sure. Uh, by the way, we, it's, it's a compound, two root words, macro. Where we, you know, we, we, which means long, literally in, in the Greek, um, and themeso, the other root, which means temper. Okay, um, the idea behind this word is to set your temper fuse for the long haul. That, that's literally, that's really what this word is meaning. You know, we should be setting that fuse for the long haul, knowing it's going to be, you're going to take a while to get out of there, right? Imagine you're down in a tunnel somewhere and you're going to set a fuse on the dynamite. You, you need a long fuse because it'll take you a while to get out of there, right? That's the way we should be seeing all this. Set our temper fuse for the long haul. All right. Anyway, the gentle tone is back in, in this address that James used, brothers and sisters, instead of, hey, you filthy, rich, blah, 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 whatever, you know. He's got this gentle tone that comes back here, um, brothers and sisters. So the Lord's coming is compared to the harvest of crops here. We have to wait patiently for the crop to be ready. It does no good to watch a plant grow. Um, with, uh, especially with impatience, right? You sit there and go, remember those commercials that were on TV a little while about, uh, what it was, Black Friday or whatever, and the lady's out in front of the store going, open, open, open. Remember that? You know? Yeah, so, I mean, if, if you stand before a tree and you want that fruit so bad, you're just, oh, come on, come on, come on. What, you, what are you going to end up doing? You're going to end up picking them all. Because, is it ready yet? No, that's no good. Is it ready yet? No, it's still not good. And you know what I'm saying, by the time they are ready, there are going to be any left, right? Setting your patience fuse for the long haul is waiting for the, the fruit to be ripe. There is a time coming where it's, our harvest is going to be ripe, and the time will be ripe for that. In the waiting, it can be, it can be hard to wait, but... It does no good to watch a plant grow with impatience. It will grow as time goes, and the crop will ripen for harvest when it's the right time. I I heard someone say once, and it was talking about evangelism, spreading the, the gospel to other people and inviting them to put their faith in Christ. And... The saying was, if the fruit's ripe, you don't have to yank it. 
right? It's very true. If you ever picked fruit at all, you know, I know there's some that you still have to clip, but, you know, in general, most fruit, if, if you reach a hold of it, just a gentle little twist, it'll come off in your hand if it's ripe. But if you're yanking on it, it's not ready yet. Let it, let it wait. It's not ripe yet, right? So uh, that's the same way it is with, with evangelism. If a person is not really ready to, to put their faith in Christ yet, don't yank on them. Just water and feed, water and feed. And when they're ripe, it'll happen. You know, but it's the same thing when we're waiting for our day to come, for that redemption, the time when the Lord will come back and set all things right. It's coming. It'll happen. Our redemption is coming soon, and um, it will happen. But we have to, in the meanwhile, be patient as we wait for that. In the case of the reader asking God, how long will you allow the rich to get away with mistreating the poor? How long till you sin justice? Right? We are to be patient because not only has the Lord been at work on it already, but He's also at work now, currently, and will soon return and bring everything into submission to His righteous rule. And in the meantime, he's kind of working on you, too. Remember that. So be patient, because he's wanting you to get all fixed up just right. All right, verse 9. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. All right. This verse reminds us of chapter 3's talk about our speech and the destructive ability it has. And, and to give us motivation, we're to remember His return is any day now. Just remember, it's any day now. Uh, just as kids watch out the window for parents to return, if they're gone, the parents are away at the store, what have you, and the kids are peeking out the window to see if the parents are coming back yet. Um, just because uh, they, they don't want to be making trouble at the time um, of the parents' return because then they'll get in trouble. So, you know, you could look every now and then and then clean up this mess real quick as they're coming up the driveway, right? Anyway, we're now to, uh, we're, we're to know that our Lord's return is near. He's in the driveway, so, so to speak. Uh, he's at the door. Look, the judge is at the door. See, that's what he says there in verse 9. So, um, it's rather that our, uh, this, uh, this verse, uh, by the way, um, this, this verse doesn't imply a loss of salvation, as some might try to say with this. Um, you don't lose your salvation for grumbling. Uh, being, if you're grumbling when he returns, he's not going to say, oh, you're not mine then. I mean, that's something that I might do if it was me, you know. But I'm not the Lord. Right? He's got a lot more patience than me. It, so it's not about, this verse isn't applying loss of salvation. It's rather that our actions would shame us as disobe disobedient children. And we don't want to be that. So when Christians are bickering and grumbling against each other, it's not a proper representation of Christ. So there, there's that same theme coming back out. In addition to that, we would surely lose rewards in heaven for that disobedience on earth, right? All right, verses 10 and 11 now. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who, are, who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. You know, you, you've all read the story of Job, and you know how it ends. He had to endure a lot of affliction before it finally came back around, but the Lord blessed him even more so, tenfold at the end over uh, what he had before. So, um, he is, Job is, an example of sacrificial, and he's, he's, not the, he's not the example of a sacrificial animal, but the example of the long-suffering, obedient servant, um, af who after having great wealth stripped away from him, was willing to say, the Lord is given and the Lord is taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord, right? 
And again, Job even said, if, even if he kills me, I will serve him. Wow. That's patience. That's, you know, an ability to set that fuse for the long haul right there. Uh, anyway, Job's humble attitude was something that God boasted about. And after the trial, God rewarded him with much more than he had before. So the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Remember that. As we re read in 1 Corinthians 10.13, it says, God will not allow more to come on us than we can bear. So have that attitude when we're going through it all here and now. Even if he takes our trial to the extreme and allows it to bring our death, we'll still serve him, right? Like Job. He'll do it in a merciful way, and we'll be ushered into his presence peacefully, as in the case of many of the biblical servants of God. So while we're waiting here, don't be like the rich. Don't have the worldly attitude that steps on everybody else. Wait with patience, enduring all the hardships and the troubles that those others might put on you, uh, enduring the way we might be mistreated in this world, enduring the time of maybe going without a little bit or watching. Maybe you're somebody who used to be comfortable and as times change in our economy, you've gotten to a place where you're not as comfortable as you used to be anymore because of what it's done to you. But be patient. Hang in there. The judge is at the door. That should be our attitude during this time. And then with that attitude, we'll be displaying the proper face of Christ out there to the world. They'll be seeing what they need to see, the right thing. Right? So that's our marching orders for this week. Next week we'll start off in verse 12 and we'll be able to finish up uh, the book of James next week before we move on into Galatians later. So uh, join with me in a, in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, your guidance, and your blessing that you give us. The understanding that you give us as we go over it, read it, and, and uh, study Take the time to let it soak in. Lord, thank you for the guidance that you give and for allowing us to get to know you better as we read your word. Uh, guide us into the things that we should be about doing. and Help us, give us the strength to be able to present the proper face of Christ as we interact with the world that you've placed us in. Thank you for the opportunities and thank you for the blessings and the protection. And in all these things, we praise you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you all this week.